Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Thank you, Alexis. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. You may have heard that I have a new co-host here with me today. Alexis has joined us. Alexis, welcome to Real Foot Forward. Thanks, Scott. I'm glad to be here. So where where have you been uh, most recently? Tell us about where you came from. Well, I recently came from Docent Land here at Discovery Park, and I've I've worked my way up to social media manager, and now I get to be partners with you on the podcast. Fantastic. So you were a docent. Um, what was that like? Um, it was the most fun job I've ever had. I loved it a lot. Super fun. Hanging out with guests all day. Um, the Docent family really is a family. Now, we, you, you were hired before the summer. Mm. but you mm-hmm. could not start that is we, true and, but we were so impressed with you and we were willing to bid you farewell as you went off to a summer camp mm-hmm. to, to be a counselor all the way and, in pennsylvania and and so yeah tell me tell me about that i'm fascinated yeah so i was a docent um and i left for pennsylvania to work at a summer camp lake Bryn Mawr camp in pennsylvania it's in honesdale which is a really small town but it's about t- two hours from new york and I was a group leader there where I, I was over an age group of girls um, and I was just a mentor for them throughout the summer. All of my girls were 13 and so I did that for a couple of months and it was my second and last summer. And then I came in as a social media manager here. So what, what has been your most favorite part about working here? And how, first of all, how long have you been here? Um, it's been officially a year, like since we're in October now. But how long, well, have, November you been, now. How long have you been just in the uh, position of social media manager? Uh, social media manager, I started in August, August the 23rd. Okay, so it's, it's been longer than I thought. So mm-hmm. what's been your favorite, what's been your favorite part of being the social media manager at Discovery Park of America? I think my favorite part is I love doing what I went to college to do. I love nonprofit work. Um, I love the experience that I get to have with people that I work with. I really do feel like everyone that I work with is for me, um, is helpful, is wanting me to be successful, is wanting the park to be successful. Uh, A lot of our values are aligning and, you know, caring about the guest experience and people leaving better than they came in. So I think overall, I just love this job. I just love being here. Well, and we love having you here. Thank you. And so every podcast recording i'm going to ask you before we talk to our special guest what is something you have discovered this week at discovery park of america perfect absolutely what i recently discovered actually was during one of our moments of discovery with our docent manager michael larkin he was talking about how jupiter the planet has over 60 moons every day they're finding more moons but the thing about it is our graphic that we have on the wall on upper level in the space gallery We have a picture of Jupiter, but there's a little shadow in front of it, and the shadow is one of the moons. And the main topic of conversation around Jupiter is how it's difficult to capture a perfect image of the planet because there are always moons somewhere orbiting, so it's just interrupting the picture. I mean, I just think it's really cool that we have the little shadow on our graphic. It's a great talking point for kids and families that come in. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I know you are uh, excited as I am to hear about our guest today. Today's guest here. It's also Veterans Day. So we thought, what what a great day for you Heck and I yeah. to have a veteran um, on our show. Our veteran um, is Zach Elliott with Mad Cal Defenses. He's opened up a new shop here in Union City, but he's also um, he's also had a fascinating life. So welcome, Zach, and, and tell us a little bit um, about where you came from. Okay, so uh, we're originally, the Elliots are from, uh, most of us are still in Gadsden, Alabama, uh, where there's the Goodyear factory was, uh, and then when they opened the, this Goodyear, uh, my grandfather, that was like 69 or I think, uh, my grandfather got offered a position up here. He was the, uh, he worked in the, the quality control, and uh, so him and my grandmother uh, moved up here back in 69, and 
From where? From Gadsden, Alabama. From Gadsden, Alabama. Okay, they didn't have to move mm-hmm. too far. No, not too, not too far at all, but uh, just far enough, I guess. <laughs> uh, and so we, uh, they, uh, now we've, we've lived in the same home uh, right off Bethlehem, uh, where, they're right, right, where they're building the interstate now. Um, my mom, they had my mother and my uncle, and uh, I was born, uh, mom had me very young. I was, she was 18. Pops didn't uh, really, they didn't get along, you know, 18, you know. And so, uh, grew up for just me, my brother, and mom, pretty much. So, y'all kind of all, y'all kind of all grew up together. Yeah. It's, and it's just like, like, we didn't go to Alabama much. They had like one family reunion, you know. Uh, so, it's just been, it's like, you know, grandparents, mom, and uncle. And then my brother. Where, so, where did you go to school? Uh, Ridgemont Elementary. And, uh, well, my mom got married to, uh, got remarried. And he was in the Navy. So we went, moved to Virginia Beach. And then we went to North Carolina for a little bit. And then, but we eventually wound up back here. So I went to Ridgemont, O'Brien County. I tried Westview for a few months, but it wasn't, I was already an O'Brien County guy. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, that there's, uh, uh, we're recording this on the day there's a big game tonight. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah between, you know, Bryan County and Westview. I'm not from here, so I just hear about it from other people. Oh uh, well, uh, if West, uh, so I played football in uh, oh, Bryan County, and my entire four year career there, I don't think we won a single game. Uh, I know my <laughs> junior and senior year, we didn't win it. We had a great time, you know. We were all like, you know, great parties, and it was a lot of fun, but <laughs> we did not play very good ball. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't we're regret also- it at all. We're also recording this on uh, Veterans Day, and so I know you're a veteran. Tell us a little bit about what motivated you to enlist and, wh- and what, what your uh, military career was all about. Uh, so growing up, you know, without – I just like single mom, and she's like working good year, and like uh, – so it's just me and my brother a lot, and he's four years younger than me. So it's like that awkward age where he's like a little too young to be like uh, – you know, but not – to, you know, where he's not like I'm like an Indian. I don't have to like, like care for him, but he's like doing his own, you know, it's just a bit odd. I was, I graduated and then he was a freshman, you know, but when we go home, we, I grew up in an out in the middle of outside of Reeves. You know, I didn't have my mom's working all the time. We had no one, I know friends lived within like anywhere close to us. So when I was 10 years old, my grandfather gave me a uh, 22 Marlin 60, 22 rifle. So I would just go, you know, roaming out into the wilderness and shooting at birds and cans and stuff like that. The gun would break because it was like an $80 one we got at a gun auction. If I didn't fix this or I couldn't figure out how to fix it, I don't get a, I don't have a gun anymore. Just started tinkering and getting – that kind of caught on where I was like tinkering with like – I would start just taking things apart, putting them together, taking things apart like my PlayStation and clocks and just like random things all the time. Trying to take it apart, just put it back together. Graduated high school, tried college, wasn't for me. I got to do something exciting. At the time, we had, you know, on the news, it's Afghanistan, you know, uh, fighting the Taliban and all this. Felt like it's, you know, it's a uh, part of like every, every, all my, all the men and like my grandfather was in the army. Uh, my uh, father was in the military, the uncles or everybody served. So it's like kind of, a, you know, my responsibility at this point. And uh, so I tried Navy. I was never going to be a Marine. I don't have that, like, embrace the suck in me, you know? Like, I mean, respect to the Marines, no, no, uh, but not for me. So yeah. I just wanted to shoot guns and, like, blow stuff up. You know, if I'm going to join the military, I want to do stuff that you can only do, like, in the military. And so join the Army, and they show you these little, like, trailers, uh, like like a little, like, snippet of what the job might entail. And they showed the Cav Scout or Cavalry 19 Delta Cavalry Scout. It's like dudes like kicking in doors at night and shooting like tanks and Bradleys and all like that's it. Like I'm in. And so I did that for five years. Uh, I loved it. I went to station in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Did a few deployments. The last one is what kind of ruined me was uh, to Guantanamo Bay for nine months to uh, pull, like uh, that was during the whole um, when they did the Bergdahl trade for the five, you know, back then. Yeah. So, I guess there was like a threat from Russia or something. I don't know. And so they had an, we were the only active duty unit to ever before or since then, because we just messed all sorts of stuff up. But um, the army started changing after that. It went from more like we're training for war. It was like a band of brothers to very bureaucratic, um, you know, it's all about who you know and who you're impressing and stuff like that. And so um, decided that they were like, told us no more deployments for probably for the rest of our lives. And I was like, all right, well, time for me to try something different. 
I uh, got accepted to UT Knoxville and went there for a few months. Again, school, I hated it. So I uh, started working. I moved to Chicago, tried to, I started working at a Lamborghini and Bentley dealership. So sold, you know, I'm also a car guy, you know, so selling the most beautiful cars in the world. And it's like the perfect, like, I don't have to buy the car. And then, you know, like, so I just get to ride around in them all day. Um, but the hours sucked, the bosses sucked, you know, even the customers are calling me like two in the morning because those Lamborghinis, like tire went flat. I'm like, I'm the salesman, you know, like, what am I supposed to call them? <laughs> and which, which city was this? This is in Chicago. Well, it was Downers yeah. Grove. So the West, West suburbs yeah. is, uh, the, sure. is where I was at Downers. Yeah. Um, then cr- cr- uh, I met a girl and uh, she was graduating medical school and then COVID happened. And so there's nobody's buying exotic cars during COVID and she got accepted to a school in California and I was like, all right, well, let's go. And so moved to California in the middle of COVID and it was perfect timing. It was right when gas dropped like negative $40 a, a <laughs> barrel of oil. It's like 80 cents a gallon. It was beautiful. And so uh, got to Cali and I lived there for three or four years and that's where I started getting into the guns because I'm a Tennessee guy, you know, I don't, uh, and then army, you know, I, I had a gun within arm's reach since I was 10 years old. California is, um, it just felt very, I couldn't buy ammo. I couldn't do anything. You can't go to the stores or any of this. I'm not sure California resident and you do all these, like, you know, these hoops to jump through. And uh, I can understand like in Chicago, Illinois has its own, like a pretty strict gun laws, like the Floyd cards stuff like that. But I could understand the logic behind them. California, I could not, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It just felt like I was just, um, I'm, I'm being opened up to being a victim here. And San Bernardino is where I lived. And that is a very uh, rough area i went to i want to go to the mountains right and so i didn't think about neighborhood safety but with our first like two months there there was a mass shooting at the walmart so like all right so kind of freaked me out and um but i couldn't buy guns there's no way no matter what like it was just so many obstacles and stuff it was gonna be impossible so i started doing the 80 percent and building um which is where kind of like mad cow was born and uh i'm went, oh, i'm sorry i skipped a part here Excuse me. Uh, when we went to start to pack to leave to move to California, uh, I didn't really know anything about California gun laws. I just, you know, the talk of the town, you just kind of know that like all this stuff, is 10 round magazines, you know, like the, the base. Uh, so about the time the toilet paper pandemic happens uh, is when I started to, we started packing up to get moved to California. And um, so I'm looking in my safe or my like, you know, I had too much of like a big walk-in closet just full of like gear and ammo and guns. And, you know, um, I'm thinking all this stuff is going to get me uh, put in jail. So I don't want to get, she's just graduated medical school, right? She's got like, she's like hundreds of thousands of dollars in school debt and she's worked her, you know, like 10 years into this. So I don't want to jeopardize that for her. Right. Um, so start selling all this stuff and I'm just blown away with how fast and how much money like people don't care. Like, they'll pay. I could have put like a $10 piece of plastic on there for a hundred dollars and someone would have bought it. And, like no questions. Like I'll take two. And so, uh, you know, it kind of launched it forward. And then also the COVID or the, the, the stock market crashed. And so I'm looking at Bitcoin and it's like $3,000 for an entire Bitcoin. And I've got all this money. I just made from all these parts. So bought a Bitcoin and, forgot about it for a few months and uh you know it's kind of made a few wise decisions um but when i would come home um uh, like visit for like holidays and stuff like that uh you know like justin uh, uh there's another mark kissel you know there's a lot of buddies of mine mark kissel is actually my very first like customer um i shout out mark hope he still likes that gun that, that paint job but uh from there and it was like word of mouth so now um, i'm kind of getting tired of like the uh, the you know the bright colors and all that i'm just kind of toning it back down now from getting all the excitement of like oh like i can do this and paint this and paint this um but now the word of mouth is starting to catch for for people for people who don't um know much about uh guns or how they're designed or painted or whatever why don't you go into a little bit of detail about the uh, Sarah Cody. Is that how I say that? Uh, Sarah coat. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's powder Sarah coat, coat, but it's got a, yeah, so Sarah yeah. coat. It's a- so for those folks at home um, who don't know a lot about painting guns, uh, tell us a little bit about, I know that you're Sarah coat certified. Um, mm-hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So, uh, there's a, well, for, there's a lot of hunters out here, especially for, I guess this podcast is going to be predominantly 
West Tennessee, real foot area. So a lot of these guys are going to know there's dirt coat, all these finishes, bluing, you can put on your firearms. Well, uh, looking into like, what am I going to paint my guns? You know, I've spent a lot of money on my firearms. I don't want to just cheap out on the finish, you know? So uh, Cerakote is the industry leading, it's like the, the gold standard for, uh, you know, a durable finish. It's good for automotive parts, you know, aqu- aqu- uh, aquatics and, uh, you know, firearms specifically. Um, they, you know, they even have these YouTube videos where they like do uh, the, the time lapse and they like put like a, a, they'll put like a shotgun. They'll put one shotgun with a Cerakote, another shotgun, just like your standard bluing. And they'll put it in the bottom of like the Atlantic Ocean with a camera there and like time lapse it. And it's just uh, phenomenal, uh, the, the resistance it has to, you know, weathering and all. And so. So you started doing that with your own guns. Uh, yeah. And I know you have a flair for design because I've seen I some do. of them. And, yeah, I do. Yeah, I have an imagination. Yeah, you, you're, you've are you got, you know, a, a lot going on there when it comes to creativity. And um, so uh, what was the first the first gun that you started working with paint wise? Um, and and how did how did that creativity develop? Um, so the first gun I ever painted was a, uh, a six hour P320 the handgun and then a uh, Smith and Wesson shield, the 40 cal. I painted the, the Smith and Wesson desert sand and then I painted the Smith and Wesson. I painted it a uh, Robin egg blue or Tiffany blue. Right. It was, uh, it came out, it was very uh, difficult. So it's a, it's a process, right? You have to sandblast it and get a certain, uh, you know, finish on it. And then you have to, you know, you gas it, get all the oils out and you have to cook it in an oven and then you paint it. And you have to paint a particular way and mix it a certain way. And then you have to cook it again in the oven for, you know, to harden, uh, you know, to cure your, your finish. And then um, and that it's not until these like three hours, four hours have gone by, then you get your finished product. And then you get to see if you messed up your paint job or not. Right. Um, so it took a few times getting the hang of it. I'm using like $10 Harbor Freight paint guns and just the cheap stuff like. Uh, we're literally putting it in my grandfather's like like kitchen stove, you know, uh, to like cure the uh, paints. Um, but he got it done, and um, but again, my my buddy Mark gives me a call, or he saw something on my Snapchat or social media, and he's like, "Man, I would like to get." He had a an old, that's like a nineteen eighties, um, you know, pre band assault weapon, right? And it just needed some love. Painted it sand, and the thing came out marvelous. I even sent it to the company that makes them. And they like, wow, can they ask me for like the permission to use the photo for like, uh, you know, their products and stuff like that. And, um, so I took that as like a, you know, maybe I'm onto something here. Well, about that time, my brother went to, my younger brother, he went to UT Martin and he's a pie. He did everything I told him to, like, don't join the army staff. Like, this was a mistake. Like, go to college and be a, join a fraternity, have fun. And so he did, but he, uh, he got a, de- his degree is in lingu- he's a, in Spanish. I think it's linguistics as a uh, you know, proper point lack of a better term spanish speaking right he just wanted to teach spanish so the whole time i'm like said should be like maybe like an accountant or go to like a biologist or whatever like who speaks spanish but no i just want to teach Spanish. <laughs> so then he gets out and he's sitting there he calls me he's like hey i need to help like find like an online gig or something kind of tutoring you know like and we're trying to find and that's where it was like i got to witness it like helping him try to find like a you know get started I got to witness it firsthand. Like uh, people are on there from like Guatemala, like five dollars an hour. They'll teach you how to do Spanish, and the people who are trying to pay like thirty dollars an hour want to learn Spanish from someone whose like native tongue is Spanish, right? Not some redneck from West Tennessee. <laughs> and so it's a hard reality, you know. But like, I'm sorry, but and I just crushed him, right? And so I'm like, all right, Seth, like you're gonna listen. And so I taught him, like, look, we're gonna teach you a trade. The Cerakote thing is a uh, new and upcoming. It's popular. People make it's good money to do a good job. And then you'll be a Cerakote who a, Cer- a Cerakote applicator who speaks Spanish, right? <laughs> like so, um, you know, it's um, like you know, the you know, West Tennessee. We have a pretty respectable demographic of uh, you know Hispanic, and really that's a, a, a like a large a large customer base uh, portion of our customer base is uh, of the Hispanic community here, and it's all because of. You know, uh, he works at Lacavania part time still, and uh, they're all great people. So, anyways, it worked out, and he took to the painting like a fish in water. I mean, I would where I'm like learning how to like you know I'm like stiff and clumsy and goofy. Uh, man, he just had it flick of the wrist, and I just yeah. let him take it on from there. And so he's actually the only one who's actually Cerakote certified. I'm just the gun guy, so I fix and tinker and like you know come up with the 
or I'll tell him, Hey, let's do a star Wars theme on this one, or let's do Jurassic park theme on this one, or, you know, let's do the Nerf gun, something like that. But I could never, he just, he far surpassed me way early on. So let's back up to California. When I, when I last interrupted and diverted us, you were in California with the medical school girlfriend Psychiatrist. Um, yeah. Psychiatrist. Wow. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so Thanks to head doctor. Yeah, there you yeah. Go. And so you're going to end up back in West Tennessee. So uh, what happened to get you back home? Uh, well, I was just going to and fro, um, like to kind of like, um, you know, make sure everything's staying organized and, uh, you know, update the inventory to make sure, you know, the – if there's any like tools or improvements, I come in like build a an extra room as like sandblasting room or whatever it is. Um, but then uh, the laws started to change in California, and I, the original plan was to set up two locations: one in here in Tennessee to just do Cerakote and gun smithing and all this, like what we have now, and then the one in California would be all the parts and eighties that just kind of because it's, it's you can't get guns there. They're, they're basically the way they like they've gone around it. It's practically impossible to get a firearm so the 80 percenters are huge there so that was the original idea but then they banned 80 percenters and so i couldn't even get like what was just on our regular um like on our website orders and all i can't get my distributors to like ship them to me and so and then about the time um yeah ethan is our the landlord um uh, well it's nailing you know i don't know if you know the nailings but um he was a customer of ours. And so I'm just talking to him and telling him like, you know, the problems like oh, I've like banned all my, I can't like get any products here. I've got to figure something out. And he's like, you know, I've got this location that we're like refinishing right now and it's like, almost done. And, you know, I'll give you a good deal and you know, I'll set up right here in downtown. And if you're interested, like you can check it out. And so, so for anybody who doesn't know, uh, the whole section of uh, downtown union city is being developed with apartments and uh, retail and so I guess they must own that building that you're in as well. Um, great folks. Uh, love having them in yeah. the community. Ethan's a great and, guy. And so you, um, are you living back here in West Tennessee now full time? Yeah. yeah uh, so she's uh, my um, girlfriend at the time. Uh, she was from California, which is why she's like, you know, she was going for colleges out there. Gotcha. So she was very, uh, she was, um, uh, Asian, right? And so they're very they're just, fire, firearms and guns just never has ever been a part of their culture. And her parents didn't speak a lick of English, like they were. She was like a first generation and all. So um, I mean, they're great people and all, but it's like they don't they didn't understand the guns, they didn't appreciate it, and it started kind of becoming where it snowballed into. I've never taken a paycheck out of this. Everything like this is just my heart and soul. Everything I've ever been or ever had is all in this. And so uh, the parts and all just started getting everywhere, you know, there's just clutter. And uh, it was, it, it was like, um, you know, it's uncomfortable, right? Because there's like gun parts and boxes and shipping and tape and just like, you know, bubble wrap and stuff just everywhere. And sure. I'm constantly like running around looking for stuff and keep getting phone calls all day and trying to build websites. I never built a web, you know, like that was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, but I, I, you know, figured it out. So started putting a lot of strain. I'm going to come out here and do this, maybe take a break. And it just, you know, uh, the way that things go sometimes. So yeah. no hard feelings or anything like that. Uh, but it's just, this is where my path took me. And So you're back she, here living in West Tennessee and you've opened this store. Talk a little bit about the challenge because there's a lot of people listening that have interest in a variety of areas and they're yeah. thinking, I wish I could open a store and honestly tell them how they could. Um, well, uh, opening a store is okay. I would opening a gun store is a completely different echelon of not okay. It's, um, <laughs> there's the licensing. Well, just the waiting period, you know, like you, I applied for our license like March and I didn't get a call until October. So I was like, pretty much took a year just to get to the inspection process of, of like getting, uh, maybe we get the license. Then it took like two months after all that to, for the license to show up. And then there's a whole new learning curve of like all these new gun laws and like how you're supposed to like, you know, uh, conduct transfers and log thing. And it's just, and it's all the, if you mess them up, like, you know, they have kind of like these, uh, it's like, everything's like a 10 year prison sentence with $250,000 fine. So it's like, you know, kind of nerve wracking where <laughs> you don't want to mess, you don't want to mess that up. <laughs> right. So, uh, and then, you know, the, like my PayPal account got shut down. They shut down my personal and business account. 
Um, they don't really, it's like kind of arbitrary. Like you can't like argue that uh, they, they, it's just whatever it happened, happened. Sorry. And Venmo, uh, eBay, like a lot of the online outlets are very, but you know, and I, I, I can, again, I can understand the logic because you do have like criminal, that's where the criminals, it's the risky business is the online realm, but um, that's the future of, you know, especially during COVID, you know, um, even now, like I'd say like 70% of our business is online. Um, but really the, I just, this is just, uh, I'm only here. I'd like, I prefer to be out in the County where I can shoot guns and it's not so much, uh, you know, risk involved, but, um, just the way it went. But, uh, uh, as long as you get your licensing and you do, I was, i never had any, I don't have any, no one taught me anything about business. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not took algebra one, like three times in high school. I just never, it just doesn't click for me, you know? Um, but if you just do, I just do good business. I treat people the way I would like to be treated. I give it my, I get every project, every customer comes in. I give them my hundred percent effort, you know, no, no shortcuts. If we come out, something's wrong. We start over do it again until it's right. And, um, that's all it really took to, uh, I mean, the proof is in the pudding here. You know, um, we haven't necessarily like, made it yet, but, uh, in just a matter of like a year, year and a half, uh, I feel like we've come a long way from like, you know, the corner of grandpa's shop to, uh, <laughs> like in our own location. And, uh, where we are today, um, I never dreamed it would ever be. I can remember when I first got that, like a plot for the EIN and that got my eBay store going. I was like, all right, if we can make $5,000 a month, I'm a happy man. Like we'll be okay. And we blew that away in like the first like six months where I'm, and I'm so every, since then, I'm just like, I have no idea what to, I'm just like holding on for the ride, you know? So, <laughs> well, and, and you mentioned one thing that was interesting to me, to me when I was in there is you mentioned that a lot of times people will come in with old antique guns, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's not all yeah. about new technology and, uh, Cerakote. It's also about, uh, tinkering around with, with vintage guns, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, so there are, we do get some, and, uh, unfortunately some of them are not worth the, what it would cost to try and get them back to new, uh, really if it's like a family heirloom or something, we'll like fake it together. So it looks good. It doesn't actually work, but it looks like it might work. And then you just like hang it up. Right. Um, but I believe that there is a, um, you have to go back to your roots to kind of like, uh, get your, you know, get their imagination kicking. Um, and then specifically in like the pre van era, like the late 80, mid to late eighties there, uh, the Tech Nines, the Mac Elevens, the the Uzis, all, all these firearms. Uh, they were they're such bizarre designs and uh, strange mechanisms. They just look like you know some of them even look like they're from outer space, from a different time. Um, and then that kind of I think that momentum got snuffed out uh, with the '94 ban, the assault weapon ban, and it just so now here we are, you know. Uh, still dealing with ARs, AR-15s and uh, Glocks, so the guns that have been out for 40, 50 years. And um, I can't think of any other, like, uh, I mean, the true dream would be like, if I could figure out how to like come up with like an electric gun, like a lightning bolt gun or some kind of ray gun or, you know, ultra sonic boom blaster, you know, some kind of crazy space gun. Uh, but that would take like quantum physics and things that uh, I'll probably never have a, a grasp on to, well, never, never <laughs> so, say never, never say never. No, no, uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the goal is that if I can at least inspire with paint jobs and like the cool ah, uh, like uh, inspire like a child who like maybe some kid walks by and sees like some cool fancy gun, and that's what like lights the, the sparks the flame for that kid to be the one who creates like the the lightning bolt gun. I'm happy. Like that's that's cool. I just think that we have self landing rockets, self driving cars. We should have. Uh, firearm technology is is like falling behind here we had somebody's got to keep moving it forward so so when we get we're going to take a quick break and when we get back i'm going to ask you i'm going to ask oh the dog said hello i'm going to ask you a, a little bit more about creativity so we'll be right back Looking for a family-friendly vacation destination? No matter what you like, you can find something to love in Tennessee. Visit Tennessee for the mountains, the music, the rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more. Visit TNVacation.com to start planning today. 
I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you download your podcasts. This is Scott Williams, your host, and today we're chatting with Zach Elliott, one of the mad lads. So Zach, I want to um, talk a little bit. I, I read on your website where you referred to you and your brothers as the mad lads. Uh, you got great t-shirts. I actually bought a t-shirt when I was in there. Um, I went to a ribbon cutting ceremony and I wasn't even really sure what I was coming to, but you know, I loved the creative energy and the creative spirit and entrepreneurship that, that you guys um, uh, put out there. So tell us, talk to us about the creative spirit that you clearly have um, just naturally, did you take journalism or advertising or any classes like that in college? No, I took, uh, I was a uh, forestry is where I started. Um, but, uh, I, I learned fast that when you try to so, like, I'm, like camping, I'm just an outdoors guy. When you try to turn something you love into a, like a, a job, um, especially, a, not a very well-paid job and all, it kind of made me, I didn't want to go outside at all. And so try to shift gears and went into it, um, thinking like, oh, I can work from home. I'm like looking for work-life balance at this point, you know, uh, work from home, uh, I can you know, work wherever, you know, COVID happened. I'm like, oh, this is going to be perfect. But then I started getting into the coding, the Python and the thing and just does not compute. And so I, I can, I'm great with anything I can put my hands on, but can't, you know, I'm like, uh, you've seen Zoolander where they're like, uh, they're out there like beating up the computer in the, like it's inside. That's how I feel like a, you know, a caveman when it comes to computers. So uh, switched, uh, but I was already kind of committed at this point. I'm like, like a junior. And, uh, so the only really, uh, one that would have been a smooth transition and like, Oh, you're going to have to start over was business, uh, business management systems, which was like QuickBooks and, um, like, you know, uh, the websites and how to like work, um, like online sales funnels and, uh, you know, CRMs and, you know, things like that, uh, which actually proved to be quite helpful, <laughs> uh, a little bit. There's a whole lot of aspects like profit and loss and, you know, things like that, that you generally get and like market, you got to like test the market to see where you just like, you know, full sends all your money into one thing. And so where, um, did the name of your business come from? Okay. So, uh, when I was a kid, right. So, uh, my uncle was a huge, like, uh, zombie before zombies were cool. Right. Like, um, like, I mean, he would, and they, my mom would force us to watch like Halloween and Friday night, uh, 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 um, Night on Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the Thirteenth, you know all the classic uh, horror films. I mean, I can still remember to this day, like laying in bed, like terrified, uh, <laughs> and like mom's like cackling, you know, like uh, like. Was, but it, you know, eventually it sinks in, and so that's just kind of where we're playing like Resident Evil games together for the family, like, you know, Christmas time. Everybody gets together. We're playing like you know the the scary video games or uh, doing you know, and then zombies started kind of becoming a little more mainstream and. Um, You've seen that there's a movie, uh, Zombieland, with like Woody Harrelson. Sure. Um, right. So that one is actually like uh, my favorite zombie movie, just uh, where it's like family fun and, you know, kind of checks all the boxes of what would be, you know, realistic as far as a zombie apocalypse would go realistic. But uh, that in Zombieland, the zombie apocalypse there started because of a mutated strain of the mad cow disease. And if you look at mad cow disease, it is like a fungus that affects the brain. And, it, you know, like, so it is kind of plausible how that could just like uh, mutate into like a human born virus and then we'd have zombies. And so uh, it was so originally mad cow was supposed to be like a doomsday prepper store um, where like, cause the co, you know, I'm thinking like toilet paper pandemic, I'll just buy a bunch of like, you know, like uh, angel soft and just stuff like that. And uh, hand sanitizer, like little knickknacks and uh, compasses and fishing line, you know? Um, but the, the 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 there was no demand for that stuff at that point the demand was guns <laughs> and, uh, and so uh we just we just went with the way of the people and uh just turned into fancy guns and just starting to get as creative and what's what's something you don't see like uh because i don't have enough uh, so we're completely homegrown uh, bootstrapped i haven't i don't have any loans i don't owe anybody any money uh, this is all natural growth that we've just done um but to do that i have to like avoid competition right like i can't uh, i can't compete with guys who do have this, uh, this kind of capital uh where they can buy you know a, a hundred of these items and uh they can sell them for less than what i'm paying for them at, at a wholesale um so i had to get creative you know like um all right well if i can't 
if I can't beat them, beat their price, I'll beat the value. You know what I mean? Um, I'll add value to my product and that way it's worth the money. So I'm not doing this for free. And, um, that's still the trick really is to stay ahead of that trend, right? Like what's going to be, you got to be the trend setter or like kind of uh, pay attention to, you know, what's, um, where, and then I might, I, I guess I just have a personal, all my guns I built for myself, like my personal firearms, it's, it's, it's become like a curse. Uh, from the very first one, I build it. I spend months like planning and getting it, painting it and putting all the little parts on it together. And uh, as soon as I get it together, I'll have it for like maybe a week and somebody will come by and offer me just, they'll just take whatever price I throw at it. I just can't talk them out of it. And so, <laughs> yeah, to this day, I still don't have a, like, I still, I'm just using like a loaner gun because I keep <laughs> building mine. People come by and buy it. Uh, it's happened like 10 times now. So, so it's, you, you know, you've, it's, got a, you've got a talent for building guns. Who did your logo? Did you do that too? Uh, uh, so this one, we actually had a different logo that I personally preferred, but when, uh, we started gearing up to move to downtown union city, the demographics going to change that just like online website orders. I'm going to have like an older, uh, you know, community here and I don't want to like, uh, this just, I, so I kind of like simplified it, you know, I've learned in custom work that sometimes a lot of the times less is more. And so simplified it. I, I did. I had this idea, right? It's like a, like I want like a, like a diamond with, a, with an angry cow, you know? Um, but I just passed out the, the actual drawing and design of it to a freelance guy. And um, we went back and forth for a few weeks, but uh, I know it doesn't look like this would be something you'd argue for someone for a lot, a few weeks for, but uh, oh, it no. had to be very, I'm very particular with what, <laughs> you know, yeah. what, I'm so. sure all my graphic designer friends out there, you know, definitely understand going back and forth you know, over, <laughs> over design. Cause it is important. And so, I mean, you guys have apparel now and you know, um, you're right there in, in uh, downtown union city. And I'm sure a lot of people are stopping by just to see what the heck, what the heck you're doing in there. Yeah, they are. And we, as much as I appreciate everyone coming by and stopping in and checking out and I love showing off the, you know, what we got going. Um, it's just me and my brother in here and like right now working and we are working nonstop. I, I literally sleep in here some nights where I'm just trying to just like keep, People, you know, I don't want people waiting around for months, you know, weeks at a time for, you know, we're trying to keep, take care of our people. And um, so I've actually here lately, I've had to close the store. We are now operating on appointment only since that ribbon mm. cutting. Really, I almost like, I tell the chamber, like, I pretty like, bit off too much uh, more than we could <laughs> chew. Like, I need to find help, honestly. I really do. But um, yeah, well, yeah, another chamber ribbon cutting is where what I came to. Um, and to be completely honest, I mean, I was in a hurry and I just looked at my calendar appointment and I went, I thought I was going to a lab where they were doing something to try to fight mad cow disease. So uh, imagine my <laughs> surprise. Um, I certainly <laughs> expect to buy a t-shirt. So um, no, it's appreciated. It really is. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, the support we've gotten from uh, the community is overwhelming. Again, it's like every step of everything. It's like, uh, so we have like, the, there's so many local businesses, uh, like Falcon six is a, is a local guy here. And I mean, everyone's been, I would have never dreamed of this since bringing a, there's a community out there of like gun guys and like people who are just like, you know, uh, you know, whether they're constitutional, like the you know, uh, the second amendment guys, or they're just like guys who like tinker or dudes who just like seeing stuff blow up. Um, I've learned that there's a community out here that has not been, uh, there's no, centralized location we don't have a hub you know so it's like every guy comes in oh me and like two of my buddies or my high school buddies or some golfing buddies or some guys i work with so i'm hoping that i can turn this into like a collective almost like open this up like uh, cover fees on friday nights and everybody comes in like a swap meet or something and yeah. kind of bring the community together so just a and i'm also trying to figure out how i can repay this uh, i feel so i'm extremely grateful i went and met with our police chief yesterday the day before yesterday like trying to like the laser graver guns something we can do to like have to like give back um because i'm just overwhelmed i never expected any of this so yeah no that's that's great and and your success is why i wanted to make sure we got you on the podcast because i know you're doing some really cool things over there so thank you so much if somebody wants to learn more about what you're doing where should they go um you can uh best bet is to call uh, because we're running around here nonstop all day. Uh, I'm sure Alexis can attest to that, or it took me forever to get uh, to realize you know, her, her emails going back and forth. Um, but and what's your, uh, what's your website? The website is uh, you know, madcowdefenses.com. Uh, you call us 731 507 0690, or you send us an email at support at madcowdefenses.com. 
Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined us at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Thank you.